Hi guys, my name is Ramon Goose and in this video we're going to be looking at the guitars of Robin Ford. Robin was born on December the 16th, 1951. He was born in Wood Lake, California in the USA. He first began playing the saxophone at age 10 and then later at age 14 he took up the guitar. Robin's father, Charles Ford, was a country and western guitarist and singer. Robin's first instrument was the tenor sax and his main influence on this instrument was Paul Desmond who was on Dave Brubeck's Take 5. Robin's first guitar was a very hunky, hard to play acoustic guitar. Robin can't actually remember the name of it. After this, his father got him his first electric guitar for Christmas. Robin says of the guitar, it was very hard to play, but you just don't care when you're 13 or 14 years old. You don't care if your fingers kind of blister and maybe even bleed a little. The guitar in question was a very cheap Orpheus electric. Orpheus guitars were made in Bulgaria from the 1960s until the 1980s. Robin's main early influence was Mike Bloomfield and he started copying the way he played and in a couple of years he sounded a lot like his hero. Robin says, I had a very cheap Orpheus electric that I had gotten for Christmas. So we'd all plug into one amp and then I moved on to bass for a while and I picked pairs one summer and bought a Vox violin bass. That bassman stayed with me and I eventually bought a Terry Red Guild Starfire 2, 4 or 1, I can't remember which, the one with the trapeze tailpiece. That remained my, okay, I'm playing the blues through an electric guitar rig throughout the high school, all the way until I joined the Jimmy Witherspoon band. Here we can see in this somewhat blurry photo, Robin Ford playing a Guild Starfire 2 with the Charles Ford band in 1970. At the age of 18, Robin Ford's band was hired to play with Charlie Muzzlewhite and they recorded two albums, The Charles Ford Band and Discovering the Blues. After performing with Charlie Muzzlewhite, Robin then traded his Starfire for a Gibson L5, and it's with this guitar that he started his tenure with Jimmy Witherspoon. Robin says, Back then I'm sure I was playing the L5. I always wanted an ES-175, but I never got one. I bought the L5 because it was a big body jazz guitar. It almost could have been anything but that's what was on the wall at Sherman and Clay in San Francisco. It was really expensive, $1,200, which was a lot back then. It actually was not that good a guitar. And somehow or other, I figured out that I wanted something different. So I went to a store on Sunset in LA and I found the Super 400. I liked it and I think I traded the L5 and $200 for it. When asked if he had problems with feedback using the L5, Robin replied, you know, I think I did with the L5, but with the Super 400, I moved over to a blackface Super Reverb, and I don't remember having any problems. Robin says that the L5, even though it was brand spanking new, was never a great guitar. Somehow, while I was working with Witherspoon, I kind of figured that out, and I wanted something else. So I went into the shop on Sunset Boulevard, and I saw this Gibson Super 400 on the wall. I played it and asked, what will you give me in trade for the L5? He said, I'll take the L5 and 200 bucks. Okay, said Robin. So Robin Ford played the L5 with a Fender Basement and the 2 times 12 cabinet, and then he switched to the Super 400 through the Super Reverb. Robin himself says, I kicked myself for years for selling that Super 400. After Jimmy Witherspoon, Robin Ford joined the jazz fusion band LA Express, which was led by saxophonist Tom Scott. The band supported George Harrison on his American tour, and played on the Joni Mitchell albums, The Hissing of Summer Lawns and Miles of Isles. Robin has stated that the Super 400 just made no sense in the context of the LA Express and Joni Mitchell's music. It was Tom Scott who took me down to the Guitar Center and he said, I called Larry Carlton and he says he uses a 335. He didn't know the name of it, so we went looking for a 335 and bought four little stomp boxes and went to rehearsal. Robin Ford has stated this also in another interview. He says, Tom took me down to Guitar Center and bought me what Larry Carlton had been using. An MXR phase shifter, a fuzz tone, a wah-wah pedal and a volume pedal. With the Super 400, I would hit the fuzz and the guitar would just freak out. So again, Tom took me down to Guitar Center and I bought a 61 Cherry Red 335. For the George Harrison tour, Robin bought another Guild Starfire. And here we can see George and Robin in 1974 on the Dark Horse tour. And here Robin is playing a cherry finished Guild Starfire 4. When asked why he prefers an early 60s to the Dotnecks, Robin replied, with Dotnecks, sometimes when they feed back, 
They kind of choke as opposed to ringing out. They kind of close down a little bit. The early 60s models ring clear. I like a bigger neck and those early 60s guitars don't necessarily have big necks. I just like a nice round medium sized neck. Robin can be seen using this early 60s ES335 on his debut solo album called Inside Story which was released on May 1979. And you can hear the sound of this guitar across the whole album. And interestingly, this album was produced by the legendary Stax musician Steve Cropper. Robin had assembled a group of veteran session musicians to record his album, The Inside Story. And the trio of musicians, which included keyboardist Russell Ferranti, bassist Jamie Haslip and drummer Ricky Lawson, soon discovered a certain chemistry and musical affinity that led to their formation of the Yellow Jackets. And this is exactly how Robin Ford inadvertently formed the Yellow Jackets. Now there's one concert guys in 1979 when Robin was backed by the Yellow Jackets in support of his first solo album. You can see in this concert that he's using two 335s. He's using his 1958 Sunburst dot neck and also a second Sunburst 335 this time with block markers which was the same one that was pictured on the front of his debut album Inside Story. Robin's guitar playing was featured on the debut Yellow Jackets album, which was released in 1981. And for this album and subsequent tour, he used a Yamaha SA2000. Robin says, I fooled around with some Yamahas for a short period during the Yellow Jackets. They gave me a 335 type guitar. In this photo, Robin is seen performing with the great late Miles Davis. Robin says, Everyone was playing Strats in the 1980s, and it was a good recording guitar, a good rhythm guitar. That's why I even started fooling around with one, more for accompaniment. But I finally sold my 58 Dot Neck 335 and bought a 58 Strat Tobacco Burst. That's what I played with Miles Davis and later David Sanborn, and my own gigs to some extent. After this, Robin can be seen using an Esprit Ultra guitar. Robin says, Fender came up with Esprit Ultra, I think it was called. It was Fender's attempt at doing something Gibson-like. Dan Smith at Fender called me and said, what would you like? What kind of guitar would you design if you could? I told him I wanted a smaller body, double cutaway, and I also wanted to be able to get a thinner, brighter sound somehow, compared to what you got out of a 335, which started sounding too dark to me with the music of the times. Dan was really responsible for designing that guitar, along with John Carruthers and my conversations with them. Brighter woods were used on the guitar, such as a spruce top and an ebony fretboard. Robin says, I think it was Dan's idea to have a little switch to split the pickups into single coil. The guitar really made sense for me, it clicked. I only have one today, a much later model. The guitar was a failure on the market and it was discontinued after about six months. I continued to play it and then Talk To Your Daughter came out with me pictured on the cover playing it. Fender started getting calls, so Dan called me up and said, what would you think about having this guitar as a custom shop Robin Ford signature model? I continued to float back and forth between the Strat and the Robin Ford model. For most of his career around the Talk To Your Daughter and Mystic Mile era is a Fender Spree prototype made by Bill Carruthers. Robin stated that the neck was really thin on this particular model. He stated that he played the guitar so much that he almost wore the neck away. As for the pickups, Robin said in these early models that the pickups were quote, not good, but now they are. And the guitars featured a Seymour Duncan 59 in the neck and a JB pickup in the bridge. And at some point in this guitar, Robin actually used PAFs. Occasionally around this time, he can be seen using a red burst model. And this was a factory model made in Japan. At the time, Fender did not have the production facilities to build the guitars in volume. So Ibanez Japan were contracted to build them under the Fender brand. In the 1990s, the production of the Fender Esprit moved back to the USA. When Fender's manufacturing of the Robin Ford signature guitar was moved back to the USA, the first models were built by Gene Baker. Gene Baker gave Robin serial numbers two and three. Later on, Greg Fessler took over the building of these guitars. Towards the end of the run of these guitars, the quality declined. And instead of the guitars being master built, they were now team built. I myself owned one of these team built guitars and I can also attest to the diminishing quality and this could well be one of the reasons why Robin ended his relationship with Fender. And the Fender Custom Shop made three versions, the Elite Standard FM, the Elite Ultra FM and the Elite Ultra SP. The FM was a flame maple top and the SP was a spruce top 
And all of these came equipped with Samuel Duncan 59 and JB pickups with coil taps and switches. And these were made in the regular custom shop production and master built mostly by Greg Fesler. However, Gene Baker was also involved in the production. The earlier Japanese models featured all the bodies and shallow pickups and hardware. And during the 1990s, the Fender signature guitar that he can most be seen with was the Fender RF Elite. And this was made by Gene Baker. And what was different about this particular model was that Gene put some hollow sound chambers in the guitar. Robin can also be seen playing some other of his models. And that included this beautiful red guitar, which he called the Red Lady. And this guitar can be seen on the back cover of the Tiger Walk album. There's been speculation that the reason Robin left his arrangement with Fender was because Robin asked Fender to make some changes to the guitar and he was not happy with the results or the build quality. One of the last times you can see Robin using a Fender signature guitar was at the New Morning Paris concert on 2001 and you can see him playing the Fender Elite guitar with sound chambers built by Gene Baker. Gene says, I worked with Robin and his tech, Jeff Rivera, for many years Getting to know and understand what Robin likes, hears, feels and sees in his tone and guitars. I was only involved with the actual model construction for about one year as I trained Greg Fesler to take over the position, although I still catered to Robin often. While at Fender, we messed around with various truss rods to accommodate the extreme amount of underbow Robin Ford likes in his setup. Robin says more recently about these guitars, I got a little tired of what they were doing with the original Robin Ford signature model. I just never felt great about the truss rods in those guitars and I heard complaints and it made me feel bad. And one of the few reasons for this is that Robin felt the guitars were too bright and he had to compensate this with using very loud amps. So one could make the conclusion that whilst the guitar was great for the music of the 1980s where Robin wanted a brighter sound, his taste by this time had changed and he wanted the more conventional sounds that the average Fender and Gibson guitar would give him. And in this photo, we can see Robin's famous Telecaster. So this is a 1960 Fender Telecaster, which um, Robin bought in the early 90s. And it first appeared on the album Mystic Mile. In fact, you can see the guitar on the back cover of the Mystic album. Robin bought this guitar at Black Market Music in San Francisco. He said he never actually liked Telecasters, but for some reason he really gelled with this guitar. One of Robin's early influences is Michael Bloomfield, who was known for playing a blonde Telecaster. But Robin says this was not the reason that he gravitated towards this guitar. Robin bought the guitar for $3,500. It features an ash body and a rosewood slab maple neck. Robin's had the guitar refretted with 6105 frets. The pickups are original, except the neck, which has been rewound, quite possibly by Lindy Fraylon. And here's Robin with what looks like to be a 1954 Gibson Les Paul gold top. Robin says, I have a 55 that I've used a bit, like on In the Beginning and I Can't Stand the Rain from Tiger Walk. The variety of tones that come out of that guitar on that song is amazing. It's a really colourful instrument. It's also said that Robin used this guitar on the album Handful of Blues. And in fact, it's quite often the case that Robin didn't use the Fender signature guitars on his albums, instead choosing to use his vintage instruments. Around the time of the Mystic Blues album, Robin also purchased a 1963 Gibson 355. He says, I also have a 63 355, but a 335 has a bigger tone. It's a better sounding guitar. A 355 is very specific and has that honky mid-rangey thing because it's got all the hardware and machinery in it. The guitar isn't able to resonate like a 335. At least that's what I would say. He used the 355 extensively on the album Handful of Blues. And on occasion, he used the 355 on live shows. Robin even used the 355 on his 2021 instrumental album called Pure. Balafon and Pure were two things that I wrote for the record. So I was clearly looking for something very different at the outset. On Balafon, the melody is played on a 1964 355 that I've had for many years and had little opportunity to use. One of the best tones he got from his 355, in my opinion, was on the song Don't Let Me Be Misunderstood, which was from his Handful of Blues album. After Robin stopped playing the Fender signature guitars, he started to play guitars made by Taku Sakashta. He made Robin an acoustic and also a guitar called the Indian guitar. 
1999, Gene moved on to build guitars under his own name. The official signature Robin Ford Baker model featured a double cutaway and a carved top. It featured a chamber order body, spruce top, maple neck and an ebony fretboard. The Robin Ford model came with a spruce top, a semi-chambered order body, a maple neck, 24.625 scale length, bound body, body and headstock, an ebony fretboard and a headstock overlay. It also featured diamond block inlays with an inlaid logo. The control layout featured two volumes and a three-way pickup selector. It featured a mini master coil split switch and Robin's personal neck shape. The pickups were Samuel Duncan JB and the 59 nickel covered pickups. On the front cover of 2003's Keep On Running album, we can see Robin photoed with a black Baker guitar. On 2002's Blue Moon album, Robin used his Baker guitar and his Fender Telly. And in this photo, we can see Robin with a red B1 hollow guitar. This guitar featured P90 pickups with two baritone switches. It had hollow sound chambers and was transparent red in color. It had a mahogany back and a spruce top. And this next guitar, we can see Robin using a 2005 gold top 57 reissue. Taku Sakasta refinished the top to a Lucy like red color. The neck was also reshaped and had a refinish of the back. It was refretted with 6105 fret wire and a split coil push pull tone knob was installed. Robin used his guitar until around 2008 and 2009 until he gave it to Taku as a present. After the Baker guitars, Robin returned to playing a Sakashita guitar. This was called a Noah Paul. You can see this guitar on the front cover of his Truth album, which was released in 2007. He also used this guitar on his next release in 2009, Soul on 10. He says of this guitar, Taku Sakasta made some guitars for me that I fooled with, but they never quite clicked. But this particular guitar I'm playing all the time now. It has small chambers in the body. I basically use the Sakasta, Larry's Gold Top and my Tele on the new CD. Robin Ford says, he built that instrument for me in 2006 and without even talking, he just showed up in a club in the Bay Area and asked me to check it out. And I play it all the time now. When asked what pickups were in the guitar, Robin says, the pickups are Jim Rolfs and I really love his pickups. I think mine are the 57 models. On the cover of the Soul on 10 album from 2009, we can see Robin using a gold top, a 1957 gold top Les Paul. He got this guitar on loan from Larry Carlton. I have a 57 gold top that Larry Carlton gave me on a long-term loan. It's an amazing guitar. In fact, Robin has stated that it's probably the best guitar he's ever played. Coincidentally, one day Robin and Larry both discovered that the guitar was worth $125,000. Robin called Larry in order to arrange sending the guitar back, to which Larry welcomed very keenly. Not long after this, Larry sold the guitar. For Robin's 2013 release, bringing it back home, he chose a Gibson Rivera from 1966. I bought it around 1991 and as cool as it was and as much as I liked it, it stayed under the piano. Robin used it for the occasional overdub and for his 2002 Blue Moon album. But until now, the Epiphone pretty much went back under the piano after each session. After guitar tech Joe Glazier from Nashville did a refret, added a new bridge and tailpiece, it then became an integral part of the vision of the album. Robin Ford appeared on Rock Palace in Europe. And on this concert, he was sounding absolutely fabulous with a Gibson 335. He was interviewed in 2008 and he says of this guitar, it's a new acquisition, it's a 1968. I bought it not long ago and I took it to Europe with me a few months ago. It was kind of a maiden voyage and it had some work done to it. I shaved off the back of the neck to shape it a little bit and put a stop tail piece on it and refretted it. We can see some later photos of Robin playing his guitar, but now he has removed the scratch plate. And here we can see Robin with quite a unique SG. Originally this started life as an SG special, but then it was converted to have two humbuckers in it. It still has a wraparound bridge, but the headstock has a 30s L5, the Gibson veneer on it. In 2011, Robin can be seen playing this rather unusual SG guitar. Robin says, I bought a 64 Gibson SG recently from True Tone Music in Santa Monica. This guitar has been chopped. Pickups are 70s. Bigsby removed, headstock doctored. But I love this thing. It's become my number one guitar. 
the last thing I would ever have expected. Vintage is hard to beat and I'm finding 60s guitars that are inexpensive and beautiful. Look around, if you are in or near LA, you should try True Tone Music. If they are chopped, that just means they are cheaper and the old wood is what you should be looking for now. Everything else is workable. And this guitar here with Robin Ford is an SG standard from the very first period of that model. It still bears the name Les Paul on the truss rod and the Les Paul name of the guitar ended in 1963. Robin Ford used this guitar on the 2015 album Into the Sun. And looking at the videos of the recording sessions, you can see him playing the majority of parts on this guitar. He also took the guitar on tour with him as well. Robin refretted the guitar with jumbo frets and the original pickups have been replaced with Samuel Duncan Antiquities. The original tremolo was a sideways trim, which Robin replaced with a vibralo. And it's most likely that this was an aesthetic choice as Robin never really seems to use the vibrato on much. When being interviewed about recording Into the Sun, Robin says, well, I've been trying to break in this beautiful 1963 Gibson SG to be my main guitar. I literally cut everything on the record with that, except for one or two songs that I cut deliberately with the 1960 Telecaster that I have been playing the heck out of for many years now. I used the 63 SG to cut almost every track on the record, knowing that I could change it later. And what wound up happening was that I did end up going back to the Telecaster for a lot of things. I also have a 1964 SG, which I used on a few songs. So around 2015, Robin Ford owned two SGs. In 2009, Robin could be seen using this 1999 R9 historic reissue, which featured a T fade finish and a push pull coil tap on the tone knob. The pickups were replaced. Robin also used this guitar with Greg Allman and Jing Chi. Fast forward to 2016, and Robin was seen using a Gibson Les Paul R8. He bought this guitar in Los Angeles. Robin decided to change the pickups that came as standard and he called up Seymour Duncan and asked if he could try some pickups. He ended up with Seymour Duncan Eclair pickups. Here we can see Robin using a 1952 Gibson Les Paul. This guitar was bought around 2017, but Robin said the neck was too small for his hands. And although the guitar was in great condition, the neck was too small for Robin's hand. And so he decided to sell it. The guitar featured a replacement tailpiece, which was made by Joe Glazier. In the same photo, we can see the 1954 gold top that Robin traded his 52 for. The 54 had some battle scars from a non original bridge, which had been installed and removed during its lifetime. Robin decided to have this guitar converted into a 1957 with PAF pickups. Robin purchased this guitar in Carter Vintage Guitars in Nashville in August 2017. The guitar first went to Tom Murphy to have the finish stripped off in preparation for the conversion work. According to Tom, the original finish on the guitar was extremely thick. At the Gibson factory, if while removing the finish from the binding, the finish got nicked, the whole top of the gold top was completely repainted. Tom estimated the finish had been applied three times to this guitar, and that's why it was so thick. Carter Guitars was concerned the finish might have not have been original, but Tom says it was. The guitar was then brought to Glazier Instruments in Nashville for the conversion work. The body was routed for PAF pickups and a tunematic bridge was installed. The original bridge was reused as the stop bar tailpiece for the new bridge. The guitar was refretted and plecked at the shop. The guitar then went back to Tom Murphy for finishing and relicking. Tom Murphy said Robin really liked the guitar, but he had his eye on a burst and so the guitar was sold. In 2019, when Robin was asked about Les Pauls, he says, Right now, for me, a great Les Paul would be, or maybe could be it. I have let a lot of Les Paul slip through my hands. I am not the kind of person that would buy a 59 or a 58 or 57. So what I do is buy the gold tops with P90s from the early 50s. I have done a number of conversions, and right now, I'm in the middle of a 59 conversion. It's actually a 54. So there's a top on it, a flame top. Looks super vintage, just like the real McCoy when actually it's a 54 that's been refinished. The pickups are for real. PAFs, they sound incredible. In a video posted to his Instagram, on January 2022, Robin posted to his Instagram two Les Pauls. The first one was a 54 to a 59 conversion with real PAFs. And as Robin discussed in the video, it was a gold top 54 
which had been converted to a 1959 flame topless Paul. And the second guitar he has here is a new Tom Murphy 58 Les Paul. And it's stated in the description of the video that he now has both of these guitars. The last guitar in this video we're going to look at is Robin's new Paul Reed Smith guitar. Robin states that he's used this guitar on several songs on his last record, Pure. He says he featured this guitar on Blues for Lonnie Johnson, Pure and the rhythm guitar on If You Want Me To. On the Paul Reed Smith website, only 200 Robin Ford limited edition instruments will be made in 2022. The specs are, it's a mahogany body with a maple top with 22 frets and a scale length of 25 inches. It has a mahogany neck with an African blackwood fretboard. It's got a 10 inch radius with old school birds as inlays. It comes with a PRS stop tail with brass inserts with vintage style tuners and special Robin Ford treble and bass pickups with the Dojo logo. It has a volume and tone controls with a three-way toggle switch and one mini toggle isolated for a coil split switch. And it comes in a black gloss nitro finish. Thanks guys for watching the original Guitar History series and I'm going to be back real soon with some more videos.